Live from the Pioneer PBS studios in Granite Falls, it's Meet the Candidates. This candidate forum is designed to inform you, the viewing public, about the candidates running for Minnesota state office in our region. Meet the Candidates is brought to you by the members of Pioneer PBS. This program features the candidates for Minnesota House District 17B. And now, your moderator for tonight's program, Mark Fulken. Hello, and welcome to Meet the Candidates. I'm Mark Fulken. This Pioneer PBS presentation is intended to inform you about the candidates who seek election or re-election to the Minnesota Legislature. This segment features candidates who are on the ballot in House District 17B. They are incumbent Republican Representative Dave Baker and his challenger, DFL candidate Logan Courtgard. First, a few words about the district and the communities in it. Minnesota House District 17B is made up of most of Candy, Ohio County. Major cities include Wilmer, Spicer, and New London. If you reside in this district, your questions will be given priority for the candidates' answers. All Minnesotans, regardless of their residency, are encouraged to be part of our conversation. Our intention is to let our viewers gain an understanding of legislative priorities. Please direct your questions via the methods listed on the bottom of the screen. Now, let's meet tonight's candidates. By a coin toss, the candidates have determined the order in which they will appear with their opening statements. We will start with Representative Dave Baker of Wilmer. Well, good evening, <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening everybody, and uh, I want to say thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's an important election coming up, and uh, as Mark said, uh, we've got a pretty awesome district that we want to represent here in 17B, representing most of Candiwai County. Uh, my name is Dave Baker. I've been a state rep for uh, just finishing my sixth year, my third term. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this uh, role that I decided to take on uh, six plus years ago. Um, as a small business guy, I, uh, uh, my wife and I, Mary, have uh, run a hospitality company in the Wilmer area. We've uh, owned a couple restaurants, a couple hotels over time, uh, have bought and sold a few of those things, and really understand what it's like to sign the front of a paycheck. Um, I also know what it's like to uh, manage and train employees and, and the work that it takes to make sure you have a good team of people dedicated to serving other people. Uh, one of the things I think that really taught me well for this position was the restaurant industry and how I enjoy serving people. Uh, in this role, it's a different type of, kind of a serving uh, when I'm helping people with unemployment compensation issues or uh, getting businesses back open uh, that were closed because of a horrible pandemic that we're all uh, so familiar with. So it's been a number of things that I like doing. Uh, public service is, is a, an honor and a gift to do it, but it is a lot of work and it's something that I'm committed to working for again for the next two years if voters in Candiway County will have me return. Uh, again, it's uh, an honor to be here tonight. I want to thank Pioneer TV for holding this event tonight to better understand our issues and our, our candidates who's going to be running. Uh, better informed voters are going to give us better people to do the job because we've got a really tough job ahead of us and we need to make sure that facing this year's budget is going to be something that uh, if I return to St. Paul will be something I haven't been um, uh, approached with yet having a deficit. So I'm looking forward to making some tough decisions, supporting our teams and agencies and ready to get to work. So again, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Representative Baker. And now our opening statement from the DFL challenger, Logan Courtgard of Wilmer. Hello, my name is Logan Courtgard. I'm 23 years old. I was born and raised in the Wilmer area. I graduated from Wilmer High School in 2016 and currently attend the University of Minnesota Twin Cities where I study health services management and public health. In my free time, I was a part of the marching band and gave admission tours. Um, I started to run and I stepped up to run for many different reasons. Um, reason number one was I was kind of tired of the political game. I kind of took a step back and realized that what was happening in our state and in our country and I didn't really like the way it was going and I didn't like the way I didn't see myself represented. So I decided to give myself 
and other people my age a shot and run for office myself. Um, and that leads into my next point is that um, the average age of an American is around 38, but the average age of representation for Americans is around 58. And that's a difference I'd like to see reduce, and that's one of the main reasons I was running. And the most important reason I'm running is because I want to see some positive change enacted in Candy White County. It's no secret that I love Candy White County. It's where I was born. It's where I was raised. Um, I went to the Y and played basketball. I did speech in Wilmer High School, and I was a part of the music program. And I love the community, Spicer, New London, Candy White. Love it, love it so much. And I want to see it be even better. And that's why I stepped up to run. I think that the 43,000 people that live in Kenya County deserve to have representation that wants better health care, better broadband, and better education for the people of the county. And I think that I can help facilitate that and deliver that. Um, yeah, they, I would like to thank the PB, uh, Pioneer PBS for having us tonight, as well as Mark, the moderator, and you guys, the audience, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Logan. Before we start the questions, just a quick reminder to the viewers at home that you can learn how to register to vote on the Minnesota Secretary of State's website at minvotes.org. Now let's get started. As a reminder, the rules are that each question will be asked to both candidates. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. Both candidates will also have the opportunity for a one minute rebuttal if they choose. We will alternate which candidates get asked each question first. Now, our first question goes to Representative Dave Baker of Wilmer. What are the most important challenges facing your district and what do you propose to address them? That's a great question. Um, uh, over the years I've served in the legislature, those issues uh, change a little bit from the top to bottom with, with uh, important issues as we evolve to new technology and things. Uh, when I first went down in 2015 and 16, I was the chief author for broadband. Uh, we spent, uh, uh, we got the broadband office in St. Paul to do uh, $40 million in grants that first year. And every year since then, every biennium since then, we've been able to put money into the, into the uh, Office of Broadband funding to do grants around the state of Minnesota to really expand it. Are we there yet? Of course not, we're not there. But I will tell you that Candioy County is better today than it was when I went into office. I will continue to support good broadband efforts. But what's different today than what it was even six years ago is the technology has changed quite a bit. Wireless is stronger and better. Uh, satellite systems are now being deployed on a low level atmosphere that will help us. So we actually don't need to, in the hardest to reach areas, uh, get a fiber net uh, wire to them everywhere they go. So, we are finding better resources to express and to maximize our, our uh, state dollars for this reason. Um, I will tell you this year, no other year like I've mentioned already before is gonna be balancing our budget. I'm a big supporter of schools. I want more uh, resources for our teachers and our, for our school buildings to make sure that we're taking care of our kids. Uh, I've been on transportation, so I think funding for roads is super important. And we do a lot of funding already for schools with a gas tax that you already pay. Um, I think it's really important that we look at our healthcare system to make sure that we're ready to deal with the pandemic as things are gonna kinda come up and change. I think our state has done a good job early on with recognizing this pandemic is real. We've kept our numbers low here in Minnesota or stable if I should say that, but we didn't have any of the outcries like we were worried about back in March and April. I'm gonna get busy with a lot of these kind of issues, but I'm very dedicated to helping the folks in most of Candy White County. Thank you, Representative Baker. And now, Mr. Courtguard, the same question for you. What are the most important challenges facing your district, and what do you propose to address them? Thank you. I've been talking to a lot of different people from around our district for quite a little while now, and one of the biggest things, like Dave mentioned, was broadband. I firmly believe in fiber opti optic broadband as the best option. Um, I would agree with Baker that wireless for the last step is the best, but wireless internet overall is more expensive, it's more expensive to start up, it's more expensive to upkeep, and it's quite, le quite frankly not as reliable in storms and just in general. Um, so that's where my major focus is getting fiber optic internet to most people out in Kenny White County. Um, I would point to the Paul Bunyan Telecom Company up north by Bemidji. They've been able to do that and to, to write uh, rural areas around up north, and it, the project's been working out fantastically, and I'd love to see something like that happen in Wilmer and Kenny White County. Um, education is also important to me. I graduated from Wilmer in 2016, and I know that our teachers are struggling. They're not being paid enough. Um, 
Quite often they're paying out of pocket for their school supplies for their classroom, materials our children use to learn every day, and I don't think it's right that they have to pay that much out of pocket to do that. Along with that, I'd say healthcare. Healthcare is great in Kenyua County. It's fantastic, but not everyone has access to it, and it's not as affordable as it could be. And I would propose making it more affordable through regulating drug, company, drug companies and other different policy decisions. Um, but most importantly, I just think we need to get through this pandemic together. I mean, it's been a tough year. It's no doubt about that. But we can get through this together and it just requires some united government and that's something I'm hoping to bring to the table. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Courtgard. And our next question goes first uh, to you. What are the candidates' opinions on today's minimum wage and do they think that it should be higher to help those who can, who, those who rely upon it? Absolutely, I'm a huge proponent of increasing the minimum wage. I've read countless studies saying that every penny of minimum wage that we bring up goes back into the economy and it's great for business. Um, business owners benefit from a higher minimum wage. Not to mention minimum wage directly um, affects young people and single families. So providing them a higher wage equates to a better quality of life for individuals who are doing these minimum wage jobs, which most of which are these single families. So I think by increasing the minimum wage, we can give a better quality of life to all Minnesotans. Thank you, Logan. And Representative Baker, the same question to you. What are your opinions on today's minimum wage and do you think that it should be higher to help those that rely on it? You know, again, as a small business guy, I think that the market determines the rates of pay. Um, there's a lot of employers out there that do a wonderful job with a lot of benefits, and I think that um, as, a, as an employer myself, what I don't want to have happen is the government telling me how to take care of my employees. If I do a good job with paying them a fair wage with some benefits, maybe it's a free meal when you work at the restaurant. Maybe it's uh, discounts for your family when you stay at the hotel. There could be other things that I would want to set up, but what I don't want is the government telling me how, what benefits to offer my employees, um, if it's family leave or maybe it's something else. I am seeing and watching the world around me so that I need to compete with others to make sure that I don't lose my good employees. So I get very hesitant and cautious when uh, a government thinks that they should, they should tell me how to pay my employees because what it does is it pushes up the bottom of folks that are in training, maybe young kids, maybe uh, folks that don't have quite the skill level, but it's going to hold the others down because I can't afford to bring it all up. And then if I have to raise the price of a hamburger by a dollar or two dollars to help pay for what I consider uh, uh, wages that don't need to be as high, uh, it's going to put less people at the table and it's going to cause less turnover in an evening for that server who's not going to make as many in tips because the prices got a little bit high. So what I want to explain is there's a balance between uh, what you can charge and what you can receive when it comes to certain service industries or um, retail industries. If you want to pay somebody 15 bucks an hour, why stop at 15? Why not go 20? The problem with that is that you can't just keep charging higher and higher um, and think that this is just uh, uh, how this world works. It doesn't work that way. You've got to make sure that you do supply and demand. Um, but right now, uh, I think the state should step aside and let business owners do what they do best, and that is to react to the market, uh, use the supply and demand, and pay their employees as best they can with what they can afford. Thank you, Representative Baker. Our next question goes first. Oh, pardon me. Uh, now we're going to go to Logan Courtgard for a rebuttal. Like I said before, raising minimum wage is good for business. It reduces turnover, it, in, it increases employee retention, and more so, it helps the economy. Uh, like I said, these employees are gonna put the money they get back into the economy. Um, great big businesses like Costco have great ret uh, employee retention rates because of how much they pay their employees. They pay them above minimum wage. And minimum wage is minimum wage. It is the absolute minimum we should be paying someone. And I think that if we were paying people what their labor is worth, we wouldn't have, be having this discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. Now we'll return to uh, Representative Baker for a one minute rebuttal. And again, I, I can appreciate um, Logan's response to that. Here's the thing that, uh, again, I wanna caution people on. If you walk into a large box store right now, whether it's, uh, uh, he mentioned Costco and others, you walk into their bathroom stalls, you see uh, help wanted, they're charging, they're, they're offering 14, 15, $16 an hour right now. 
they're following the market. They know what they have to do. Um, I don't think we need people to look at what a minimum wage is, but what people get confused about is what's a livable wage. There's a difference there. A minimum wage should be teaching new people entering the workforce, brand new, first time, how to answer the telephone, how to dress properly, how to read a schedule. But a minimum wage is different than a livable wage. And so that's what I want to make sure that we, as a business, and or for example, the government, doesn't get involved where we don't belong. So I think it's very important not to put a minimum wage higher than it needs to be. Thank you. And now our next question goes first to Representative Baker. How would you ensure that every Minnesotan has health care? Well, health care is, again, uh, one of the top items that we have to deal with. Right now, anybody can go into the hospital or if they need some care, they will be taken care of. It's, it's that responsibility of that provider to make sure that everybody is taken care of and nobody is turned away. There's some good parts of the Affordable Care Act that I supported, which is the um, uh, taking care of folks that had uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, the, the age of 26 where you could still stay on your parents' plan is a really good idea. But here's what's happened along the way is that it got very expensive when uh, pharmaceutical companies could sort of uh, set their own price lines because no matter what, you cannot be denied for any kind of drug, whether it's $5,000 a dosage or $5 a dosage. They got greedy and I think that caused a lot of concerns. So what we have to do in government now is to try to find that balance about how do we keep uh, providers competitive so that uh, a CAT scan in Wilmer, Minnesota isn't going to be uh, twice as much as it will be in St. Cloud, Minnesota, or vice versa. We have to make sure that uh, we have more transparency and openness about what are procedures and what they cost. Um, I do know that there's some providers that do provide great stuff like Mayo and Again, I'm very proud of Keras Health and, and what they're providing even in our own county. But I want to make sure that we do it with transparency, with openness, because we have to be competitive in that field to make sure that we've got the best doctors, the best nurses, the best staff to provide that kind of care. But right now, I want everybody to have that insurance. I want everybody to have a good job so they can have insurance hopefully through their employers. It's all about a robust economy, getting people to work, getting a good wage, that can be competitive and uh, just that is how we are going to get uh, affordable health care for everybody is get everybody back to work as best we can. Thank you, Representative Baker. And now, Mr. Courtguard, the same question to you. How would you ensure every Minnesotan has health care? There's many different ways we can make health care affordable in Minnesota. Um, I would agree with Baker on the face that making health care more transparent would be fantastic. But in an emergency and in rural areas, it's often hard to shop competitively if you only have one outlet you can go to for healthcare. I love Caris Health in Wilmer, but that's about the only option we have. And you can't really price shop and price compare if that's the only healthcare facility you have to go to. So I would uh, mention bringing in a buy-in to Minsure. I 100% uh, agree with uh, Governor Walls. Offering a buy-in to Minsure ensures that in insurance companies are more competitive and that we have a, um, we can insure more people because they can buy into an option that they might not get through their employment or if they're unemployed or if they don't have a job. They can buy in through Minsure and they can have the coverage that they need. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question goes first to Mr. Logan Courtgard. What would you do to expand broadband internet access in our area? I touched upon this a little bit earlier, but I 100% agree with using uh, fiber optic internet as the main goal for expanding internet. Um, Kenny White County does not have 100% access to internet, and I would like to see that change within the next 20, 30 years or even earlier. Um, I think the best way to do that is to use a private partner or a public partner, a public-private partnership, using co-ops and having them pri uh, partner with private companies to provide telecom to rural areas. Um, I think wireless is a great step for uh, rural areas that are hard to reach, but it's not something we can look into for the entire county. It's expensive and it's often afflicted by weather. So I would say the best approach is to use fiber optic internet that is fast and can allow Kenyuai County, uh, members of, the, of Kenyuai County to participate in the modern economy and use wireless as a last measure. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. Representative Baker, the same question to you. 
What would you do to help expand broad net internet access in our area? Um, again, I think that I, I don't disagree with Logan's comments about uh, fiber net, fiber uh, uh, wiring is the best. Uh, it's underground. It's uh, like a four-lane highway coming into your house, and it's an amazing technology that works really well. It's just not feasible to do that in every premise and every location that you want to have one, especially in some really hard reach to reach areas in, in, in all of greater Minnesota. Uh, up in the Aaron Range, it's really challenging with, um, with rocks and trees, and you just can't put it on the, um, the high lines because, again, the, the power companies don't like them on there because they can cause other issues with uh, down lines and, and again wind issues. So there's a lot of things we got to look at. Uh, again, being a chief author of this bill, putting a lot of dollars into the fund uh, a few years back, uh, we are pushing this thing forward. We want to keep it growing, but we can do it when we got the funds to do this. Now, how much can we push this forward when we're also trying to take care of our kids in the schools and, and health cares and nursing homes? So we're going to have to make a lot of these kind of decisions this year. So what we have to do is to maximize our dollars. So I think to use the the new technology with wireless, the new microwave uh, technology is very good when it comes to uh, broadband and internet. You're seeing a lot of the cable channels now offering, it used to be 25 to 50 meg uh, of download speed. Now I'm getting over 100 speed at my house uh, just because the technology has changed. I didn't change my wire coming into my house, which is still the old coaxial wire. So there's some new technologies we have to make sure we utilize. We've got to work with the incumbent operators that are already there so that we don't kind of want to create new competitors because the state of Minnesota doesn't want to be in the business of, of, of uh, supplying this to people. We want to make sure we give the people that are there that have invested already the best tools to make it happen. And we welcome new competition, but it isn't the state of Minnesota to be the provider. We want to make sure we give grants, matching dollars to get other people to spend money in our area so the state of Minnesota doesn't have to run that. So very committed to expanding our broadband further. Thank you, and now we'll go to uh, Mr. Courtgard for a one-minute rebuttal. As the chief author of the bill, uh, Dave should be well aware of that wireless is also hard to reach up north in the, rock, in the Iron Range, and it's just as costly, even more costly, to use than um, fiber optic in a lot of cases. I would say as we balance the budget, we need to recognize the necessity that this broadband is, and I think COVID has really shown us what a necessity it is. I mean, we use internet these days for everything, business, healthcare, education, everything. And I think it's important that we continue to invest in it, especially out here in greater Minnesota, where we'll get left behind if we don't invest in it now. And I think it's important that we have it so we can continue to participate in the modern economy. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Our next question goes first to Representative Baker, and it comes to us from a viewer in Wilmer. And this viewer wants to know, um, why wasn't the bonding bill passed in all of the special sessions that we had this summer? Doesn't it hurt everyone when these public works projects are used as a political football? That's a really great question, and uh, it should have been passed earlier. I will tell you why bonding bills sometimes pass and don't pass. When there are projects in a bonding bill, when we first saw the $3 billion bonding bill come to the House floor, I opposed that bill. There was far too much excess projects that should not belong in this bill. Um, we trimmed it down to, I think it was uh, maybe 1.9 or $2 billion, still a lot of money. Um, I have not supported the bonding bill yet, only because we need to have a tighter bill, something that gets rid of the light rail in the Minneapolis area, I don't believe should belong in there. There's some other uh, real, uh, what I call poison pills in the bill. What I will tell you right now is that we couldn't deal with the bonding bill the last two sessions because we went into what's called a dark period where states don't want to open up uh, new spending or new uh, uh, budget changes dramatically because they're in the middle of negotiating rates with insurance companies and their bond ratings get sort of uh, adjusted and looked at. So we were told we really couldn't deal with anything from the last 60 days. I expect a bonding bill to come up in October when we go back into session to uh, address the emergency orders for the governor. I, I want to support this one, and if it's in that $1.3 billion mark, I have told my team, my leadership, our colleagues, I want to support a bill like that that I can get to without those uh, poison pills that are not in there that I think have been taken out. They've heard us. They're loud and clear about if you want our support, which they need our support, a number of votes from the Republicans this year to pass it out the House floor. I plan on being one of those folks that wants to do that, but I've got to see the final bill. I also want to make sure that that bill is accompanying a tax bill 
that will help the farmers with Section 179, which is such an important part of their tax planning and buying new equipment. So there's packages, there's negotiating going on right now, and I'm very committed to working to get this bonding bill done. When I go back in October, I really want to bring that home to us uh, here in a few weeks. Thank you, Dave. And now, Mr. Courtguard, the same question to you. Why wasn't the bonding bill passed in all the special sessions we have had this summer? Does it, doesn't it hurt everyone when these public works projects are used as a political football? That's a good question, and I would agree. I, I'm not in the legislature. I do not know the political reasonings behind why they decided not to pass it. I do know that it required a 60% pass, and that relied heavily on the Republican members in the House. So I would ask the, my opponent as to directly kind of why he, his reasoning was behind that. I mean, they had, this has been going on for three months, and they had multiple chances in multiple sessions to go past this. The bill included $100 million for affordable housing and $300 million for trunk highways, bonds. So there's a lot of stuff in the bill, including for out here in greater Minnesota, that I think were, was jeopardized, frankly, uh, by the lack of bipartisan support that the uh, members of the House were able to get. Um, I think that the bonding bill is important and it should be a priority come October or um, the next legislative session, whenever it happens. Um, but I do think it is a direct failure from the House as to why it didn't pass. There were multiple chances, there are multiple opportunities for bipartisan support. And if I were elected, I don't think that would happen. I would push my hardest to work across the line, work with anyone, enable, I would work night and day in order to pass a bonding bill because I know it's the lives of great, greater Minnesotans out here. I mean, it's our infrastructure, it's jobs, it's literally everything that a lot of people rely on. And I think it's important that we do everything we can to pass it. And there might not be everything we need in the bill or everything that, the, uh, there, we have to compromise is the point. And compromise is a necessity in the legislature, and that's something I was, I'm willing to do to pass a bonding bill. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. And now we'll go to Representative Baker for a one-minute rebuttal. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. I think Logan made some very good points uh, regarding uh, working in a bipartisan fashion. I will tell you that I'm one of the most bipartisan members on the House floor. I work across the aisle on many issues. But again, as I mentioned before, um, it, it is a really important bill. This is a jobs bill. This is a bill that will bring a lot of jobs around the state of Minnesota, spend a lot of money. It's a good time to borrow money. It, uh, money is cheap to borrow with the interest rates the way they are. But I'm not going to say yes to a statewide bonding project that I feel has a lot of things that are going to cost us a lot more money in the future to continue to fund, like light rail in the cities, when I don't think that they can fund it themselves with, with their ridership numbers. So you've got to sometimes say no, and that's what leadership is. But I'm a, a very bipartisan member. I want to work hard, and we, we, we hopefully will get this thing passed very quickly. Thank you. Our next question goes first to Mr. Courtgard, and it comes to us from a viewer in Candy, Ojai County, who is curious to have each of the candidates state their position on Governor Walls and the Green New Deal and California emission standards. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think that clean energy is the way of the future. We will be running out of fossil fuels if we keep up at a current rate by 2060. So investing in uh, clean energy and solar power and wind is definitely a necessity as we continue to grow. As for the Green New Deal and Governor Walls, I 100% support Governor Walls' efforts with energy. He's very ambitious and I love ambition. I think it's something that we can definitely accomplish here in Minnesota with our hydroelectric our solar and our wind energy. As for the Green New Deal, I would caution and read the bill in full before I take a side on that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the bill and I'm aware that's a resolution, which means it's not a law, it's a goal as well. And I think goals are great, goals can be ambitious. Goals are what keep us going in life. So I would caution people and just take a look into it and see what the goals are and see if we can reach them and hopefully we can. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. And now, Representative Baker, the same question for you. Uh, state your position on support for Governor Walls and the Green New Deal and California emission standards. So as a member of the Energy Committee, um, I've spent uh, six years studying and looking at our rates in Minnesota, how we compete, how do we attract new business to Minnesota. One of the things that we used to be good at was having a very affordable energy rate. Uh, in Minnesota, we had uh, uh, below national averages. Now we have come up and we're likely in the top 20 
states in the state of, in the country to have uh, energy rates that are higher than they used to be. We have we have grown our rates much faster than, than other states have in the country. That bothers me. Now, I used to sit on the Wilmer Municipal Utilities Commission. I was proud uh, of that commission. I served on it for seven good years. I was part of the decision to put the wind turbines uh, in Wilmer. Um, solar has gotten incredibly cheap. Uh, I will tell you that I like renewable energy. I will tell you that I also don't want to see a new green deal of any kind that involves um, especially the California emission standards. Uh, what Governor Walls is trying to do right now is sidestepping the legislature and going right through the PUC, the, uh, sorry, the uh, Minnesota Pollution C Control Agency, and trying to take us out of the equation and just raise those standards himself with what, which, what is called rulemaking. This has me very much bothered by his approach to this. He wants to bring cleaner cars and whatever it is to Minnesota. I think our cars, for the most part, are very clean already. Um, but he's going to do this, and it's going to raise the price of your automobile. It's going to raise the cost to Minnesotans because it's going to, somebody's going to think it's going to make a lot of a difference, and it's really not. So our cars here in Minnesota are going to be different than the cars around us in the upper Midwest. What is that going to really do? So you can't do uh, uh, points like this around the country with little pods when we're sharing the same air, when the wind keeps blowing. That does not make sense. So I am a, a person who's very... Uh, cautious of any new green deal when it has something to do with uh, our rules are different than our neighboring states. So I'm going to continue to oppose those kind of things. Thank you, Representative Baker. Now we'll go to Mr. Courtgard for a one minute rebuttal. I would disagree with Baker. I think that it's important to recognize that having green energy is important and that we should not have fear mongering dictate that cars might change or that other changes might happen in the future. I don't think that will happen. And if so, it's going to be a gradual change and it's something that we as a nation not, not only Minnesota, but as a nation, we should address and look into. I also am a little bit worried about Dave's position on science is not supporting clean energy mandates. I would disagree with that. I know he doesn't believe in mandates, but I have seen the science and I've seen that they work. And I would agree with them as well. And I think we should um, use more of these mandates in a lot of places. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. And now we'll return to Representative Baker for a one minute rebuttal. Well, again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it's not about fear mongering. What I want to make sure we're open about is talking about what's going to happen to the rates, to rate payers when we have all this new green energy and we don't have any uh, baseload plants anymore that are either burning uh, coal or natural gas, which uh, I think natural gas is coming on very strong with a much lower emissions than, than coal was, but we're going to have uh, an imbalance in our power grid. So we've got to make sure that we have those and our rates stay stable so that the people that need low energy the most are not going to be the ones that are going to be forced out of their homes because they can't pay the electric bill, but they've got to make a decision between that or a grocery bill. Uh, rates matter, and affordability is really important to our energy grid and how we get it. Uh, again, I'm a supporter of clean energy and renewable energy, but we have to have the right balance or our rates are going to be farther out of whack with our other competitors, which are other states around us. Thank you. Our next question first goes to Representative Baker, and it comes to us from Morris. What will you do to support a vibrant economy in our area? Well, again, as a business guy who has seen and worked hard to put two and a half billion dollars in the rainy day fund in the state of Minnesota, because we were enjoying some really robust times here in the nation, but also the state of Minnesota. Um, we had a billion and a half dollars extra in the bank uh, as, a, as our, our current biennium, our budget, and we had that, plus that two and a half billion dollars in the savings account. So it's all pretty much kind of evaporated with the COVID issues and what's facing us now. It is a time right now that we've got to really get out of the way as a, as a government and, a, and bad policy to make sure that we do a good job in getting businesses back to work. We've got to do it safe because I know this is a pandemic and we can't ignore the science and the rules that we have to do to make sure that our businesses can keep their employees and their customers safe. We want to make sure that they can uh, make money, that they can get to work, that our roads are good. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, our policies embrace uh, in, uh, business expansion. Uh, but again, what it means is we don't tell businesses how to run their business. Business owners like me, small business owners especially, are very uh, nimble. We have to be that way in order to survive. Uh, if, if we have the government telling us all the time what to do, where to do it, 
Uh, pretty soon they'll be telling us the hours we can work. Uh, I just, my concern is uh, with their scheduling uh, mandates that they had at one point that we kind of pushed back for uh, telling uh, uh, employees that we could uh, put our schedule out two, three weeks in advance. You can't do that in the restaurant industry. You can't do that in a lot of industries that are very volatile because of weather related things. So my, my ask is that we've got to get our economy rolling again. And I think we can do that. I really want to um, support federal uh, uh, policies that give us the best environment for expansion. I love what's happening on the Iron Range right now with uh, holding back some good tariffs. So we need to do a good job, but we've got to get our energies uh, and our, our economy rolling again. Thank you, Dave. And now, Mr. Courtgard, how do you do, how do you respond to this viewer from Morris? What will you do to support a vibrant economy in our area? I think one of the best ways to retain and ensure a diverse economy is to just ensure that we have a retention of workers out here in greater Minnesota. It's no surprise or shock that a lot of people migrate from here to other states or the Twin Cities um, in search of jobs because they don't like the way of, way of life out here or they can't find jobs or they don't have access to internet. There's a many different connections and ways why that might be a thing. And I think we really need to focus on that because young people like me are the future. We are the future of the economy as well and we are economic growth. Um, and if you retain the workers and the people out here in greater Minnesota, we can ensure that the economy continues to grow. And along with that, we can ensure a, a living wage out here in greater Minnesota. And like we mentioned earlier, a living wage for greater Minnesota, especially out here in Kenyua County, is 11 22 an hour. Um, and that's still not what minimum wage is, so that's why I do support an in, in increase in minimum wage, Is so because a, a, a minimum wage should be a living wage. And if we have a living wage, we can ensure economic growth because people will want to live out here and want to work out here. So thank you. Thank you, Logan. Our next question goes first uh, to Mr. Courtgard. What needs to be done to reform current immigration policies? That's a good question. Um, I think immigration brings great diversity out to Kenyuai County. Um, we have a great Latino community. My neighbors are Somali and I love them so much. The downtown Wilmer is a huge diverse community and our immigrants definitely bring a lot to that. Um, I would caution a lot of any reform or anything about that because I don't quite frankly know a lot about immigration and that's something I'm not afraid to admit. I'm a young candidate and I don't know everything and this is one of the things I happen to not know a lot about. So I would look more into this before I create a solid opinion because I like to know the facts and I like to know the research. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Representative Baker, the same question to you. What needs to be done to reform current immigration policies? You know, again, uh, uh, Logan states he is not an expert on this and that's a tough issue because that's more of a federal issue that we need to get right. I have gone to a number of seminars and things put on by the local uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, for example, in Wilmer and we talked about uh, bringing in some experts to talk about what uh, national immigration looks like when we start reforming it. Uh, we don't have to throw everything out the window. What we have to do, though, is to make sure we know who's coming into our country, that they're the right people, that they're safe, and they're, they're going to contribute to our economy and to our good life here in the United States. When it gets down to the Minnesota region, what we need to do is to make sure that we take care of these people like we need to. They are new workers. They're new Americans, and I want to embrace them about all the great things America has to offer. What was really kind of neat the other day is I, was, I have a pontoon rental business with my wife at the Green Lake Cruises and, and uh, we had uh, four or five young Somali kids come down. They were probably 14 to 19, 20 years old and they had never been on the water before. They came up to the dock when I was putting my boat away and uh, they were so excited about being close to the water. Could we take a little ride? And I said, sure, let's go on the boat for a little bit. I took them out for a 30 minute ride. Each one got to drive the pontoon and they were so excited about, for the first time, being on a body of water in Minnesota. They had lived in the States for the last four or five years and yet didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, what I love about showing what we do here in Minnesota and the upper Midwest and really the whole United States is our land of opportunity. They were so excited because these young kids grew up in a refugee camp. So I have learned so much by talking to my Somali colleagues down in downtown Wilmer and around the state of Minnesota, downtown Minneapolis, about what they need to have. And they need good education, they need good housing, and they are so blessed and so happy to be in, in the United States. And I'm just looking forward to working with more of them. They're important to our workforces here in Minnesota. That's part of our growth in Minnesota, which we need. 
and I'm going to continue to be committed to working for and with our new uh, immigrants, our Latinos, and everybody that needs any help from us in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Baker. Our next question goes first to you. What reforms do you support to increase police accountability? So again, I've got a, an amazing relationship with our local police departments. In fact, uh, in the next few weeks, I'm gonna be doing what's called a ride along. And I have asked to kind of work and sit firsthand uh, what happens in a, in a typical squad car from uh, 6 to 10 p.m. at night. I'm looking forward to that here very much. And I, I've uh, had many meetings with our local sheriff, our police chief, and other officers. I applaud their lifestyle. I can't thank them enough to say, you put on a, bell a bulletproof vest every day to go to work for keeping us safe. Um, they run into the danger and we normally run away from it. Uh, they're well trained, they're well, they're well positioned to take care of those things. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about reforms and what we need to do. I think any kind of conversation about defunding, removing, uh, uh, is, is uh, the police departments is careless and reckless. I don't know who would really say that when if you've ever called 911, you want somebody there. You want somebody to be able to show up when you need some help. Um, and so uh, I want to support the police departments like never before. Are there some things we can do to make things better? Sure, I think there is. Are there some bad players out there? Absolutely there is. And we need to deal with those things one on one. Uh, but, but to kind of take this broad stroke about reforming uh, so many things that the police departments have done over the years and the decades to keep themselves safe and also to keep our community safe. They need better tools. We've got uh, body cameras now. We've got uh, dash cams. They've got uh, more tools on their tool belt to make sure that they keep people safe. But there are times we need to disable people that are doing bad things. And uh, I am very supportive of our police departments. Uh, I'm open to reforms and looking forward to those kind of conversations, uh, but I am very supportive and want to continue to do that. I think uh, our local departments have done a great job building great community support and relationships prior to any problems happening, and I'm committed to making sure that that continues. Thank you, Dave. Logan, the same question to you. What reforms do you support to increase police accountability? Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the police departments for being great in our community. I know many of the officers, Joe and my friend Rian is a police officer as well in Benson, and they're fantastic and they've given me tons of insight on what it's like to be a police officer in our area and what that's like and what that kind of means for the community. Um, like Dave mentioned earlier, doing a ride along is a fantastic way to kind of see what, get the point of view of a police officer along with the program Coffee with Cops. I, I'm not aware if it's currently going on because of COVID, but it's a great program as well. Um, some firm policy I would introduce is provide a neg negligent cause of, um, clause of hiring in case something happens during training. Um, you d we want the bad, the bad apples, as they say, off the streets. And we want the best and brightest police officers representing us in the community. And I think that's a great way to do that, um, as well as just kind of strengthen strength strengthening the uh, community officers and the connection with the community, ensuring that there's a, like a, an appropriate representation of Latino officers and Somali officers within our community so that people within our community feel comfortable calling the police and interacting with them so they can go to them for help. Um, and I think it's kind of dangerous to say that calling 911 in the future if by defunding the police or something like that, there wouldn't be a 911 because our emergency services have changed over the years. We didn't always have EMTs. They were born out of the fire department. And I think we're kind of at a cusp right now. We're kind of looking at redefining what it means to be a police officer and what it means to police within our communities. And I think that's an important thing we need to look at, take a look at how we can redefine policing and see if we can use uh, social workers in some cases or if we can use other officers in some cases versus just having a general police officer go out to an incident that may or may not require them. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. And we move on to the final question of our uh, forum this evening, and it goes first to Mr. Courtgard, and it comes to us from a viewer in Wilmer. When will the caretakers, like adult group homes and people who work with disabled citizens, get a raise? They absolutely do deserve a raise. I 100% agree, and I don't know that answer off the top of my head. I do think they deserve a raise. Um, they're taking care of the elderly, our moms, our dads, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job of doing it. I know right now with COVID-19, it's an extra hard job. 
it's not it's never been easy but especially now it's not easy at all whatsoever and i applaud any of those, any caretakers out there um but yeah i would agree with you i think they do deserve a raise and i don't know the logistics of how, to, how we can get there but i do think that's something we should look into and with balancing the budget that might be a little bit more difficult this year but it's something that the state of minnesota should look into thank you thank you logan dave the same question to you when will caregivers like adult group homes and people who work with dis dis disabled citizens rather get a raise I think they're going to get a raise pretty soon. Uh, we've been working on this project uh, for many years, and I'll be honest, we have not had a lot of support from the governor's office, from even the prior administration to the current one, when it comes to reforming that type of, uh, of industry. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services, DHS, is a complex and a very deep-rooted uh, agency that is encumbered with a lot of different rules and, and federal rules that come on it. Uh, I'm a proud member of the West Central Industries Board of Directors. So uh, WCI uh, has many clients that we work with, adults with disabilities, special needs. We hire job coaches that go out to businesses and clean your business. We might be mowing your grass. Uh, and if you need something, services like that, please call them because these clients that we work with are always looking for more things to do and more opportunities. Uh, the folks in that industry, uh, the folks that own and operate the uh, uh, group homes that they live in, they should be paid better. And I think the, there's been some reforming coming to make it more uh, uniform in spending and uniform in how we pay people. Pay should be getting better very soon. It hasn't come quick enough. And I have been a, a big uh, drum beater of this type of an issue because it's not right. We did a lot of good things for the nursing homes. When I first went into office in 2015, there was a 15 to 25 percent raise for a lot of employees because we couldn't keep any employees in the nursing homes. This group of people with the disabled communities should have been a part of that and they weren't at that time. We needed to bring those agencies and those uh, industries together. So I'm committed to making sure that we continue the, the push to make more monies and more dollars available to those communities. And again, in Candiaway County, we have one of the highest per capita uh, group homes in the whole state of Minnesota for people living with disabilities in our communities. Closing down the group homes was a good thing. It brought us out to the communities, but now we've got to make sure that we have the resources and the employees to take care of them. I'm committed to doing that in the future as well. Thank you, Representative Baker. As we conclude this debate, each candidate will offer a two-minute closing statement. First, we'll hear from DFL challenger Logan Courtgard. I'd like to thank PBS Pioneer for having us, and I'd like to thank you guys, the audience, for watching. Um, again, my name is Logan Courtgard. I'm 23 years old. I was born and raised in Kenyawai County, and I'm young, I'm excited, I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to work and ready to work. Um, I believe in affordable quality housing, affor affordable quality access to, affordable access to healthcare, and better education for everyone in Kenyawai County. I think we have, we owe something to our educators where we have to make sure they get the tools they need for our children to prosper. And we deserve government officials that are willing to work day and night in order to get things done and get things accomplished for us, especially right now in the world that we have with COVID-19. And to me, this is more than a job. This is people's livelihoods. This is whether or not I can afford to go to school, whether you can afford to raise your children in Kanyawai County, whether or not you can afford to eat this job is more to me than just a job. This is so much more and I don't take that lately. And that's why I decided to step up and run. I was tired of the injustices out in Candy White County and I wanted to make a difference. Um, I love Candy White County and I'm willing to fight for everything and make sure our future is bright and prosperous. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. And now we'll hear from Representative Dave Baker. Again, I want to thank the, the listeners tonight for listening all around the state of Minnesota to understand the issues, to understand who wants to actually sit in your seat, which in this case is uh, the seat of most of Candiaway County. I've had that privilege and honor to serve uh, in that role and in that seat on the House floor for the last six years. And I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd or in advance if you're going to be voting early because I would love to go back because I will tell you what I have learned over the last six years. I want to start really putting my efforts and maximize my value now as a leader who knows what works and what doesn't. I know who to work with and who, work, who not to work with because there's some members uh, that I just have a hard time working with. 
Um, but I will tell you, because it's all about trust in St. Paul. There's people that will tell you one thing, but do another. Um, on both sides of the aisle. And so I want to take my experience, go to St. Paul, if you'll have me, in January, and say, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. We've got to have a budget that we have to balance. We don't have a, we don't have like the federal government to just print money and to run with a deficit. We don't have that choice. So we have to balance a budget and we have to find the right ways to do this. And I'm going to try to do that without raising taxes. So that means we've got to get very creative. That means we've got to use our resources. We've got to use all the things we can do to make this thing work. Uh, I want to do that, and I think my leadership and my years of experience will help us in this time of need. Um, I just, you know, again, I want to um, thank the voters who have listened to me and trusted me to carry this load for them. This COVID thing has put a lot of energy on that to help businesses get open. Um, I want to thank my wife, Mary, for allowing me to run and to uh, have this kind of this chaotic life that we do live when we're in a public service like this. Um, to my voters, uh, I want to thank Logan for stepping up and running. This is a tough thing to do. And again, I want to thank PBS for the opportunity tonight to share my vision and my views of this thing. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thanks, Dave. That concludes our program. Thank you to both candidates for joining us and a special thanks to our viewers who sent along their questions. To watch this and other Meet the Candidates episodes, past or present, visit video.pioneer.org or use the free PBS video app. Just choose Pioneer PBS as your local station. Thank you for joining us on Meet the Candidates.